Welcome everyone to Recovery Month at the White House, celebrating 25 years. Please. <clears throat> I'm David Minetta, the Deputy Director for Demand Reduction here at ONDCP, and uh, it is a great, great privilege uh, to welcome you all today and to thank you uh, to everyone uh, tuned in via web stream at whitehouse.gov backslash live, and to those of you uh, here with us on this wonderful and historic occasion. I am pleased to look out in the audience and see a representation of the rich diversity that exists within the recovery community. Addiction can impact individuals and families from all walks of life. The disease of addiction has no racial, ethnic, gender, linguistic, or socioeconomic boundaries. It can take hold of persons at any age, in any profession, in any station of life. Fortunately and thankfully, Recovery crosses all of these as well. Recovery is reality for millions of people in the United States and abroad. I want to thank all of our partners who helped us get to this day and invite everyone to review the presidential proclamation designating September as National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month. And the proclamation is posted on whitehouse.gov. Now, it is my absolute privilege to introduce the Acting Director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Before his appointment by President Obama to serve as ONDCP's Deputy Director, Michael Botticelli spent more than two decades as a nationally recognized leader in the addictions field. He built a tremendous legacy as the Director of the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and held a variety of leadership roles for the National Association of State Alcohol and Drug Abuse Directors. He also made great impact in prevention with his service to the Advisory Committee for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention. His wisdom, energy, and compassion are greatly appreciated by all of us who get to work for him and anyone who knows him. And then it is part of why the president recently nominated him to officially assume the role of ONDCP director. Please join me in welcoming Michael Botticelli, acting director of ONDCP. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, and David, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I want to welcome everyone uh, on behalf of the President to the White House. It is an incredibly exciting day. It's an exciting month, and is an absolutely exciting time for people in recovery, both here and around the nation. To everyone who is watching us on live stream, thanks for joining us. We have friends from Alberta, Canada, all the way to Austin, Texas. Uh, and everywhere in between. I hope you will all submit your questions on Twitter today. I want to begin by thanking and recognizing Senator Whitehouse, who is with us here today. I was going to say a few words in a minute, but I really want to thank him and his colleagues, particularly Senator Portman, for their legislative support on many issues that are important to all of us in the room today, and particularly his support for Americans in recovery. Thanks to the co-chairs of the Congressional Addiction Treatment and Recovery Caucus, who will be joining us shortly, Congressman Tim Ryan and Paul Tonko, for taking the time to come with, to meet with us today. I also want to recognize longtime friends, uh, former Congresswoman Mary Bono and former uh, Congressman Patrick Kennedy, who, uh, who are here today. <laughs> Despite the fact that they have left Congress, they have not diminished their passion for this work, and they continue to be tireless champions uh, on, uh, in the community and in the nation for the work that they do. I also want to acknowledge and thank SAMHSA Administrator Pam Hyde, who's with us today. Uh, 
as well as Principal Deputy Administrator Kana Anamoto and the tireless SAMHSA staff, especially Paolo DeVecchio, uh, Yvette Torres, and our newest addition to the federal family, Tom Coderre from Rhode Island. Uh, <laughs> SAMHSA's leadership and support for a recovery-based approach has been unparalleled, and Pam, we appreciate your leadership and all that you do. Uh, we also want to recognize the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commissioner, Hai Feldblum, who is uh, expected to be with us today. And we would like to thank her for partnering with us to address the barriers to employment for people in recovery. We're all, also happy to see Al Ozanian from Veterans Affairs. Al, where are you? I know we met earlier. There he is back here. Uh, welcome. He is a great partner of ONDCPs in working to address issues that affect veterans and veterans in recovery. We also have great state champions with us today, and we're, we're pleased that the Secretary of Commerce from this state of Kansas, Pat George, uh, who's right back here, has uh, traveled with us, uh, and we're so glad that he's in the room. I think all of you know having champions and partners at the state level is really critical to our work. I also want to point out that we have two ONDCP Advocates for Action who are in recovery who are in the audience today. Dr. Stephen Lloyd from the Mountain Valley VA Medical Center in Tennessee. Stephen, where are you? Is it great, good to see you. And Scott, and Scott Strode, the founder of Phoenix Multisport. Scott, there he is over there, great, thank you. I would also like to acknowledge our partners in prevention who are here today joining us and joining us online. While we're talking today about recovery, we know fundamentally that this is a preventable disease and we are making great strides and progress in preventing substance use in the United States. I would also like to give a special shout out to David Mineta, his staff, and all of the ONDCP staff, not only for organizing today's event, but for their tireless efforts. I am truly fortunate that I get to work with such committed staff on a daily basis. I'm going to try to get through the next part without losing it, but uh, uh, odds are not good. Um, as a person in long-term recovery, I am honored to join you today. Over 25 years ago, when I began my recovery journey, I could have never imagined that I would be here today. I just wanted to stop drinking and for the hurt to go away. I wanted the pain in my soul to end. I could not have foreseen that I would find joy and friendship and love, that I would be a responsible and contributing member of my community, that I would be a loving husband and family member, that I would get a life free of the shackles of addiction. I am sure many in the room can say the same thing today. We all would not be here and I would not be here if it wasn't for the courage, leadership, and hard work of all the people that came before us and all, for all of the work that people in this room and around the country do on a daily basis. We are tremendously grateful. It's hard to believe that we're already celebrating the 25th anniversary of Recovery Month. In 1976, the National Council on Alcoholism, now the National Council on Addiction and Drug Dependence, convened a national event to raise awareness in an effort to reduce the stigma associated with alcoholism. That event, called Operation Understanding, marked an historic occasion. National figure, figures such as Dick Van Dyke, baseball great Don Newcomb, and astronaut Buzz Aldrin and numerous other luminaries publicly spoke about their substance use disorders and their recovery. The event put a face on the disease of addiction and it began to chip away at the misconceptions and stigma too often attached to substance use disorders. The people who spoke out were well-known individuals, many of whom are like who we have here gathered today, who were heroes in the eyes of many people. And just two years later, another historic moment occurred. First Lady Betty Ford spoke about her addiction to alcohol and prescription drugs, once again breaking the silence and shame that is attached to substance use disorders. It's unclear where it originated, but there is a quote that says, it's hard to hate up close. Putting a face on the disease of addiction and telling our stories is a vital part of our work. It is why we're here today. Many great social movements have been fueled by the simple yet courageous act of people who are affected coming out of the shroud of secrecy and, inv and invisibility. And these efforts were often led by the youth of our country. So we are particularly counting on you. 
There have been many accomplishments over the past 40 years, including the formation and expansion of drug courts, a dramatic increase in evidence-based prevention and treatment, decades of scientific research that has given us an irrefutable understanding of addiction as a health issue. The call by the American Medical Association to treat substance use disorders as a disease. The development of effective therapies and, medi and medications. Better integration with the rest of the healthcare system. More recently, the passage of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act and the Affordable Care Act, which is ushering in a new era of fair and equitable access to treatment and recovery for the millions of Americans who need it. There have been sure mistakes along the way. Too many people in need of treatment are simply incarcerated. Jails and prisons should not be our de facto treatment system. And lifelong consequences are opposed on those convicted of drug crimes. These consequences too often stand in the way of stable housing, employment, and education. And we are addressing these issues. Part of what we've learned is the knowledge that we need to do more than just treat the symptoms of a substance use or mental health disorder. For people to reach their full potential and contribute to their communities, we need to raise awareness and reduce the stigma associated with substance use and mental disorders. Build community-based recovery support services. Promote wellness and ensure that laws, policies, and practices do not create unnecessary barriers to recovery. Substance use disorders and mental illness are still too often seen as moral failings through a lens obscured by stigma, blame, fear, and hate. One of the ways that we know we can reduce stigma is simply by changing our language. As Professor John Kelly, who's here with us today from Harvard Medical School found out through his research, describing someone as an abuser leads to blame and punitive attitudes, even among trained clinicians. As with other diseases, it is important that we lead with the individual, not with the disease. We are people with substance use disorders. We are not addicts, drunks, or junkies. Thanks. I, did, I didn't pause for applause, I just needed to change the page. <laughs> Recovery is possible and it can transform us into the very best and brightest this nation has to offer. There are millions of us. We serve in elected office and we are in our armed forces. We lead Fortune 500 companies. We are teachers, students, police officers, shop owners, researchers, athletes, journalists, entertainers, clergy, clinicians, and advocates. We are your family, we are your friends, we are your neighbors, and we are your colleagues. Our community spans geographic, cultural, social, economic, and national boundaries. Together, we have the power to transform our nation just as recovery has transformed us. I am proud and tremendously excited to welcome all of you to the White House to celebrate this day and this month and this movement. And we look forward to hearing from all of our guests today. Thank you very much. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce a, a dear friend and colleague, Administrator Pam Hyde from SAMHSA. I think many of you know uh, the tremendous amount of leadership and advocacy and support that we've gotten through Pam's and her staff's leadership at SAMHSA. Um, I, and I meant what I said when, uh, when I think of, under her leadership, the work that we've done to transform our system into a recovery-oriented system of care. Uh, you have much to be proud of, and we can't say enough how much we value your friendship and your work. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Michael, and I'm with the entire crowd at being um, your biggest fans, so you're great. I'm so pleased to be here, and thanks to him and uh, to all of the ONDCP staff for all the work they did to make this event um, uh, happen, and to, frankly, all the SAMHSA staff who are also here and, and who work together, and the dedicated people behind the National Recovery Month, partners, and um, uh, a quarter of a century, a quarter of a century, illuminating and validating the fact that people can and do recover from addiction and, and from mental illness, and uh, SAMHSA cares about both. I want to especially thank the SAMHSA leadership that's here today, and I won't repeat because Michael did me, me the pleasure of 
saying something about a few of them, I do want to just acknowledge we are pleased as punch to have Tom Coderre on, on staff now. He is a senior advisor, and that means we get to work him as hard as we want to. So <laughs> we're already working on that. We're thrilled he's with us. Um, I think our country's at a tipping point. Several of us have said this, but we are. We are at a tipping point. In the last 25 years since the recovery month began, and in fact, just in the last few years since the recovery movement has really, I think, become more vocal and the research and treatment of addiction and mental illness has become more accessible, the country has really seen a tremendous change in the way people think and talk about recovery. Now, there are still some people who are skeptics. There are still some people who think we are wasting our time. I get that about SAMHSA from now and then. Got an email about that this morning, as a matter of fact. But we all have to make sure that we keep working together to make sure that people understand recovery is possible and it is legitimate and it is an important thing for us to spend time and effort uh, celebrating and uh, pushing. Our vision is a future where people who are in recovery share and celebrate their successes proudly with family and friends and people with mental health and substance use issues aren't hesitant to seek help or treatment, and it's there for them when they need it, and communities recognize that prevention and treatment and recovery support initiatives are critical to their community's health, so they actually support and invest in those initiatives. Now, those of you who participated in the event that uh, happened at the press club uh, on September 4th know that we released some data that day. And yesterday, SAMHSA released more data on substance abuse. And I want to share just a few numbers and trends with you to add to what we talked about a week or two ago. Because the 2013 NISDA data shows that we have actually some good things to celebrate. And frankly, some things we that are not so good that we need to still work on. So the 2013 NISDA data that we released yesterday show that there's actually been a reduction in non-medical use of pain relievers among persons 12 and older since 2009. That's good news. The problem is it hasn't moved much in the last year or two and it's sort of, sort of flattening out and there are some issues within that we need to pay attention to. Past year heroin use continues to rise since 2007 and past month heroin use has risen as well but at a lower rate. And the overall rate of heroin use is pretty low, but it is rising, and we need to pay attention to that. Now, the data gives us some particularly good news about young people aged 12 to 17. This is something that we can really celebrate because we've been putting a lot of effort collectively on prevention for young people. So between the ages of 12 and 17, the rate of illicit drug use actually continues to fall since 2009. Marijuana use is actually even down among this group. And the use of psychotherapeutics is down from 2012. Inhalant use is down. Hallucinogens are down among that age group. Unfortunately, between the ages of 25, 18 to 25, we're not doing so well. Uh, for these, this group, uh, illicit drug use overall was kind of flat, but that's because there were some decreases in some areas and, frankly, a lot of increase in marijuana use. So we're watching this. There's a significant increase from 2008 to 2013 in marijuana use. Therapeutic drugs is down some, hallucinogen is down some, and cocaine use is down some from 2005. In my age group, past month, any illicit drug use among 50 to 64-year-olds has continued to trend upward since um, about 2002, so in the last decade. And those, for those who are 55 to 59, if you're in that age group, it was um, about 1.9% in 2002. It's now 5.7% in 2013. That's a problem. And among 60 to 64-year-olds, which I will admit is my age group, there was a rise from in the last 10 years um, in illicit drug use. Now, these baby boomers are um, mothers and fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers of youth that we are trying to prevent from starting use in the first place. So we have to get the message of prevention and treatment and recovery to my generation. So our sons and daughters and their kids don't see use of drugs as a way to enjoy life or ease their troubles or avoid the difficulties life inevitably brings, and so they don't deal with the issue of addiction. I want to say a quick word about marijuana. We're all concerned about it. Among all groups aged 12 and older, daily marijuana use has increased over the last few years, and the percentage of those using marijuana 20 or more days in the past month has risen significantly in the last decade. And that's just to 2013. We're watching closely 
to see what the decisions in various states and various communities are going to do in terms of those data. And as you know, unfortunately, the NISDA data show us that a lot of people who are, are uh, indicating the need for treatment, there is a profound gap between those who need treatment and those who get it. So while we have a lot of proud, uh, much to be proud of, uh, we also have a lot more to, to do. But today is not about data, uh, even though I wanted to share that with you. It's about promoting the power of recovery. And that's what we're here to do. And as we look toward the future in the next 25 years, we'll soon move past this year's celebrations and events and marches and even White House events and redouble our efforts because in the end, we all know that Recovery Month is about lives. It's about the lives of our friends and neighbors, our brothers and sisters, our aunts and uncles, our kids and grandkids. It's about ourselves. It's about our families and our communities and it's about the human condition and ultimately it's about hope. Getting people's attention, the attention of a nation, is hard work. And part of that hard work is being done by those you're going to hear from today on the panel. They're making their voices heard, and I just want to acknowledge that speaking up with a personal story of recovery is courage in the purest form, and these folks are our heroes. And advocating tirelessly on behalf of Americans who've experienced addiction or mental illness and who are in recovery is the stuff of heroes, some of whom have already been introduced today. And I have the pleasure now of turning over um, the mic to one such hero, the United States Senator from the great state of Rhode Island, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Thank you, Pam. I'm uh, delighted and honored to be here to participate in the celebration of the 25th anniversary of Addiction Recovery Month, and uh, it's a particular personal thrill for me to be able to do it in the company of, first of all, my terrific colleague, uh, Congressman Tonko, who I see more than some of my colleagues. We're always going to the same events. Um, but with a bunch of fellow Rhode Islanders, this is kind of Rhode Island Day here. It may not be as visible, Michael, as you know, but it's... It's true, we have uh, Congressman Patrick Kennedy who used to serve in the State House of Representatives. We have uh, Tom Kader of Rhode Island who used to serve as a state senator uh, in the Rhode Island State House. We have Jeffrey Tights lurking back there, counsel to NDCP, used to be counsel of the Help Committee, who was the youngest chairman of the House Judiciary Committee in Rhode Island ever. And we have Bill Emmett, who is one of our best advocates here as well. So you're in company that you should be proud to be in with all of my Rhode Islanders. Uh, I'm actually here to bring you a good report from Congress. Oh. <laughs> who knew? As Pam and Michael have pointed out, there has been a really significant cultural shift that has taken place on a number of issues, and addiction is one of them. And we're starting to see a completely different legislative paradigm emerging. Uh, not too long ago, I got a Recidivism Reduction Act through the Judiciary Committee that among other programs, focused on making sure that people who were incarcerated not only had access to treatment services to deal with addiction before they got out, but actually got rewarded for participating by being moved more rapidly through less uh, intrusive incarcerative settings. And that passed, remember the days of lock them up, throw away the key? That passed 15 to 2, and it was so bipartisan that the two who voted against it were one Democrat and one Republican. <laughs> so, and uh, today, uh, Senator Portman and I introduced our Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, um, along with another bipartisan pair of senators, Amy Klobuchar and Kelly Ayotte. And we also have as an original co-sponsor the chairman of the committee that it's going to go through, Chairman Patrick Leahy. 
And we have considerable interest in the bill, but we're trying to have the, be the Noah's Ark rule. You come in two by two, bring your other party uh, colleague, and, we'll, and you're on board. So it's been a really, really strong start. And um, I, as much as I want to celebrate that piece of legislation, and as much as I want to celebrate 25 years of paying attention to addiction recovery, I think more than anything else, I want to celebrate the fact that this has changed. And I think there's no going back. There is no need for there to be continued stigma. There is no need for there to be continued shame. Indeed, people are starting to learn that the hard path of recovery is actually something that we really need to be proud of. It speaks to courage. It speaks to determination. It speaks to resiliency. It speaks to putting your past behind you and moving on. It speaks to things that are noble in the human character. And to have that move is really more important than any other move. Um, I'll close with a particular thank you to Patrick Kennedy, who served with such distinction in the House of Representatives, whose parity bill was mentioned already, and whose efforts at getting it implemented continue. And uh, he is determined to make insurance companies that are giving lip service to compliance with the parity bill uncomfortable. And we look forward to working with him. Patrick, God bless you. Thank you all very much.